Hi, my name is Hannah Jane Kandel. Um, I'm at the University of Wyoming, and um, uh, like Neil, um, uh, I have one of the smaller teams here. And also like Neil, I work on protoplanetary disks. Um, and so um, what I'd like to talk about actually is, um, so the, the project that um, has been uh, funded through uh, Nexus is called Structure Dynamics and Evolution of Planet Forming Disks, which is, um, you know, uh, modeling of protoplanetary disks. But I also wanted to talk about some of the other um, research that my group is doing at the University of Wyoming as well. So um, under the topic of uh, structure dynamics and evolution of planet forming disks, um, we are working on um, uh, modeling disk-planet interactions to identify signatures of planet formation in protoplanetary disks, and then also modeling gaps in disks. Um, to you know, try to look at, for instance, HL Tau or um, TW Hydra, which have been imaged so spectacularly by Alma. Um, but then there's other work going on in terms of uh, modeling debris disks, which is a later phase in planet formation, um, detection of transiting exoplanets, and exoplanet atmosphere characterization that I'd like to talk about also. So. Um, so as uh, uh, Neil mentioned, my uh, grad student Dylan Kloster is going to be working with him this summer. Um, and I just wanted to highlight some early results that we, we've um, accomplished. So um, what I'm showing here are some hydrodynamic simulations of uh, a, a disk. So this is with, without the planet, with a 30 Earth mass planet and a 300 Earth mass planet. So this would be the mass of Jupiter. Right, and you can see that, that there's a gap being carved in this disk. So this top row is showing surface density in the disk. Um, you can see that a 30 Earth mass planet causes a small perturbation. And then what's being shown in this middle row is what you would see in these disks if you were to image them in H-band. Okay. And so in, in the, the, um, the disk without a planet, you see some kind of ring-like structure, which you know, may or may not be a numerical artifact. We're still trying to uh, work that out. But um, if you look at the Jupiter mass planet, you can see some evidence of uh, this gap being open, but you can't really identify where the planet is forming. And actually the most interesting simulation here is this um, sort of intermediate mass planet, about 30 Earth masses, where you can see that there appear to be some kind of spiral arms forming in the surface of the disk. And so the, the, the key point here is that what's being imaged in H-band does not reflect what's going on in the surface density of the disk as a whole, what's going on is you're seeing just what's going on the surface of the disk. And so what's being shown here is a slice through um, a high layer in the disk. So this is maybe like five or six scale heights actually above the midplane of the disk. And so what you're, what you're tracing is the density in that region of the disk. And so this is just showing that you know, it's actually quite complicated to try to figure out what's going on in a disk simply from observing, particularly if you're just looking at scattered light in near infrared or optical wavelengths. Um, these, uh, I also want to highlight that one of our resources at the University of Wyoming is the Wyoming NCAR Supercomputing Center. And so these simulations were run on that um, supercomputing center. Um, it's uh, jointly run with um, NSF, and basically any university researcher in the country with NSF funding can apply for time on the supercomputer. Um, so I realize that's, that's NSF and not NASA, but I just wanted to highlight that anyway. All right. Um, so on the, the subject of disks with gaps, so I have a, um, a second grad student, David Casper, and um, Tyler Ellis, who's um, a post-baccalaureate student, so he's one of these students who finished his um, um, bachelor's degree at the University of Wyoming, stayed on for an extra year, um, did some research with me, and he's going to be um, a grad student at LSU this fall, and I'm very sorry to lose him because he's an excellent student. Um, but so what uh, uh, David Casper and Tyler Ellis have been working on is looking at these images of um, uh, HL Tau and TW Hydra, where you can see quite clearly in, um, so this is now we're looking at millimeter, submillimeter wavelengths. So this is probes a different, different um, uh, regime of the disk than you do in near infrared and optical. Now you actually are probing the structure of the disk as opposed to just the surface layers. And so you can see these clear rings forming. And so this is from an earlier paper um, of mine where you know, I did study gap opening in disks, and you could actually see um, you know, the effect of uh, gap opening by a planet. And so what they're trying to work on is trying to figure out, well, you know, if these disks were caused by planets, how big would those planets be? Um, which gives uh, good constraints on um, where um, and when planets form, as well as their, their masses. So uh, these, these two topics, this, um, the planet-disk interactions and the disk with gaps, is basically work being supported 
by um, the, this NASA grant. Um, I have also a NASA ADAP grant, which is supporting work to model debris disks. So debris disks are later stage in planet formation. So the gas in the disk is cleared. You're left with basically just dust. Um, and so this is, uh, this is actually, I believe it's HD181327. It's um, a chronographic HST image um, using STIS. And you can see that there's this uh, lovely ring here. Um, and if you look at the Spitzer um, IRS spectrum, you can see that, so here's the stellar photosphere. And so so, here. so this, this, this line here is supposed to indicate the, the spectrum. The, the blue line is the photosphere fit to the star. And so everything that's being uh, increasing out here beyond about 15 microns is infrared excess. And we can model that. Um, with actually um, a, a two populations of dust. And so this indicates that there's a population of dust at about 14 AU and another population of dust at 93 AU. So the 93 AU population of dust corresponds to this uh, location of the ring, but um, our results indicate that there's a, a probably a hotter population much closer to the star as well. And so by combining both HST and um, Spitzer data on a, a number of debris disks, we can, again, reveal a lot about what's going on in these disks, where and when planet formation is taking place. So another project that I've undertaken, this largely involves um, undergraduates. So you can see David Casper and Tyler Ellis have also shown up working on this. Um, their job was basically to take our um, 0.6 meter Red Buttes Observatory and automate it for um, observations. And so we've been participating with the uh, KELP collaboration to do follow-up of um, transiting exoplanet candidates. Um, and so I have a team of undergrads working with me, including Rex Yai, Aman Carr, and Rebecca Sorber. Um, and so this is just a, um, uh, an example light curve that we've been able to uh, get with uh, our 0.6 meter telescope. And we've been able to achieve um, 0.6 millimag precision. Now, granted, that depends on things like the weather and whatnot. But um, it just shows that you know, we, we've been able to um, do some good science with this observatory. And especially now that it's automated, it's going to make it all the more easier for undergrads to participate in the research we're doing. All right. And um, the last topic is um, exoplanet characterization. So in addition to our 0.6 meter telescope, we actually have a 2.3 meter telescope. Um, we call it WIRO for the Wyoming Infrared Observatory. And um, David Casper, who's, who's you know, this grad student extraordinaire, I have to say, is also working on this project um, to do transmission spectroscopy of transiting exoplanets with our 2.3 meter telescope. Um, he, um, his first data taking run was this month, and unfortunately, the weather was bad. So all I have to show right now is simulated data of what you would expect uh, for the transit in two different wave bands. Um, and so basically, what, what um, you know, we have a blue channel and a red channel. And the idea is what's being modeled here is essentially Rayleigh scattering. Right, so that because uh, Rayleigh scattering, you have more scattering in the blue wavelengths, you expect the transit depth to be shallower than you do at red wavelengths. And so um, we're hoping to do some good exoplanet characterization with our um, uh, WIRO. And um, yeah, so, so just to show that you know, we have a variety of different projects and resources at the University of Wyoming to do some exoplanet science. So thank you.